welcome to worship here at First United Methodist Church, Fort Scott, Kansas. My name is Reverend Christopher Eshelman, and it's my joy to welcome you to worship this day. As you may know, I've spent a good portion of the last month traveling, and as I got back home, I find myself reflecting on home and our connection how we are related to one another in Christ. And with July 4th this past week, the nature of Christian freedom. This day we're going to hear a fairly long passage from the book of Galatians. But we'll hear a paraphrase of it, not a translation, but a paraphrase by a man named Eugene Peterson. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. But he embarked on an exercise to write the text of the, the Bible in not only contemporary language, but as a prayerful reflection. It's a practice I recommend to you to read a passage, to reflect on it, to write in your own words what it means. And then to hold those words that you write loosely, because they are, after all, not a translation but a reflection, a personalization of what the word speaks. I also, last week, published our July newsletter. And one of the things I did in the July newsletter, I reflected a little bit on our journey, my travels, and our journey together as I begin year three here. But I also stuck a blurb in, I think it was on page seven, I said, Whoever contacts me with the code word can pick a hymn. So far, I've had two people contact me. But the first person that responded was Nancy Richardson, and she wanted to hear and sing uh, Count Your Blessings, which is a song that is not in our hymnal. But when Pastor Steve was here, you did sing it a few times, and Pat, of course, had the sheet music. And so because Nancy was the first person to respond with the code word, which I will not give you because it's still in the newsletter, <laughs> she got to pick the hymn. So I invite you to stand and join in singing our opening hymn, Count Your Blessings. <laughs>
Please join me in the call to worship. Rejoice, people of God. This is our Sabbath day. Rejoice, friends in Christ. This is our time for worship. God ordained the Sabbath, rest, and restoration. God is worthy of worship, our creator, healer, and inspiration. It is God from whom our blessings come. The one who calls us. The one who loves us without end. Amen. You may be seated. The scripture is from Galatians, and it is from the message, which is a paraphrase. It's absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows, for everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence. Love others as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. If you bite and ravage at each other, watch out. In no time at all, you will be annihilating each other. And where will your precious freedom be then? My counsel is this. Free, live freely, animated, and motivated by God's spirit. Then you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness. For there is a root of sinful self-interest in us that is at odds with the free spirit, just as the free spirit is incompatible with selfishness. These two ways of life are contrary to each other, so that you cannot live at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel on any given day. Why don't you choose to be led by the spirit and so escape the erratic compulsions of a law-dominated existence? But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Legalism is helpless in bringing this about. It only gets in the way. Among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good, crucified. Since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts, but work out its implications in every detail of our lives. That means we will not compare ourselves with each other as if one of us were better and another worse. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives each of us is an original.
The scripture reading is from Matthew 11:25 to 30. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who, that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
May God bless the reading, hearing, and doing of the word. And I'll say, Amen. I invite you to continue standing and join in our hymn of preparation, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, number 526 in the United Methodist Hymnal. You may be seated. So as I said, I've been thinking about home and connections, and that passage we read from Galatians in many Bibles is subtitled, The Nature of Christian Freedom, The Nature of Human Freedom. Who are we as humans, as people? In the sermon title, I 
use the spelling of connection that John Wesley would. It's also the title of our newsletter. It means exactly the same thing as the correct spelling today, but we Methodist nerds often use it in part to celebrate our connections with those who have gone before us. What does home mean to you? Robin and I have begun referring to the parsonage as home. I'm home when we get home. Now I know and you know that I will live there as long as the bishop appoints me to Fort Scott and then presumably we will move to another parsonage. This is my fifth appointment depending on how you count. I'm 55 and I would anticipate ser serving at least three or more three or four more churches before I retire. I'm not from here. I don't intend to live here for the rest of my life, although I wouldn't be against it. But this is home, at least for now. And this church is home. Is this church your home? Are you here by family connection or did a wandering journey bring you here? Some maybe not even yet articulated need caused you to wander in one Sunday and then, like many of us, you just keep coming back. And it becomes home. At our best, we are a place that exemplifies the risen Christ. A place that each of us on our own journey, we are seeking to know and grow in and serve and share Christ. And that we recognize that we are individuals bound up in a common journey. Worshiping a God beyond our understanding, but one who is not distant from us, but who knows us intimately, who has walked this human life, a God who can do abundantly far more than we ask or imagine. I struggle sometimes with prayer. That hymn we were just singing reminds me to take everything to the Lord in prayer. And where I get hung up is, oh, there's a thing that's weighing on my mind and I'd like it solved and I want answers and clarity, but you know, God, if you're willing to you know, reach in and just kind of arbitrarily change things, my thing is way down on the list of things I'd have you arbitrarily change. There are parishioners who need healing. There are plagues of poverty and violence in the world. My concern is so small, God, don't, don't worry about it. I found myself doing that just yesterday. And I'm reminded that taking things to the Lord in prayer is not about pressing buttons on a vending machine to get what we want. It's not about telling God what to do. It's not even about God arbitrarily changing things. It's about centering ourselves in this God who can do abundantly far more than we ask or imagine and aligning what we are doing with God's will. I'm not in charge. God is in charge. If I am centered in God's will, the choices I will make will lead to good, fruitful outcomes. Not that I will get what I want or think I want, but that I become part of this body of Christ, this witness that is far larger than our congregation or our denomination or our vocabulary. It's about taking it to the Lord in prayer that we might be shaped. It's about counting our blessings, about naming them one by one, even in the midst of trouble. Robin and I have gotten very good at that, particularly when it comes to car trouble. You know, car trouble is frustrating, but we can focus on, ah, it broke down here, not there. And when I look back at the car troubles we've had over the last 10 or 15 years, we have been deeply, deeply blessed with where and when things happened. I don't think God wanted our car to break down. But I do think good choices lead to being in safe situations rather than dangerous ones. Being aware of resources. I can hear my grandfather saying, it's only money. If it's only money, it can be fixed. 
Other things are harder to fix. And I'm reminded of home, of connection, of wisdom that has gone before me. I've talked several times about being incredibly moved by this piece of art on our mission trip, a saw blade that had been painted a couple generations before of a man plowing the land that his extended family still lives on. And somehow I was blessed, I was certainly not the only one, but I think I was the one that spoke up first, that just said, we have to take really, really good care of that piece of art. That is more than a saw blade, that is home. And by taking good care of it, by making a big deal out of it, by asking to hear the story, by making sure it was mounted again before we left, we conveyed a respect for their place and their story and their home. A promise that the projects that we had begun but couldn't finish would be completed, that we were not abandoning them, that we were turning the project over to yet other servants who would come and continue fixing this place that had been damaged, that it might be warmer and safer and drier. You might remember we had to leave what was supposed to be a relatively simple project of replacing the flooring that turned into a massive project that opened up other things that needed to be done that hadn't even been on the agenda. We had to leave it like this. And yet, they were home. We got this picture that Randall was in the hospital when we left and we didn't get to say goodbye, but they sent us a picture. They appreciating us, us appreciating them, a mutual respect, a relationship that goes way beyond the work that was being done. And the next crew came in and they picked up where we'd been and they laid the joist and they put the uh, insulation in and they laid the subfloor and then they had to leave. And yet another crew came in and now they've finished the floor in that room and they've reassembled the bed and it is beginning to look like home again. And that crew went on into the living room and they took out the rock that was there and those two crews have now laid the floor in the living room and then they went on to the kitchen and it wasn't as extensive, it was more like what we were originally supposed to do in the bedroom. But now it has that same finished floor and the entire house is now level instead of sloping and sturdy rather than rotting and insulated rather than open to the elements. It's warmer, it's safer, it's drier, it's home. And that is only accomplished by the body of Christ working together. Not individually, not being too concerned about our part of it, but working together. Recognizing the necessary connections that we have in Christ with these people, with this place, that we might serve, that they might bless us with their stories and their vulnerability. We are connected. Jesus says to his disciples in our reading from Matthew today, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I don't know about you, but I, I don't want a yoke. I want to be free. I want to be able to do whatever I want to do. I want to accomplish what I want to accomplish. I want to be in control and decide when things are done. And it's really frustrating to me to leave things undone, at least things I don't want to leave undone. Take my yoke upon you, Christ says, and learn from me. What if we saw a yoke not as control or confinement or limitation, but as guidance, as assistance, as making our necessary and real connections to each other more fruitful and efficient? It's Christ's yoke. And Christ's yoke fits well. If a yoke on oxen doesn't fit well, it actually hinders the process. It creates sores and disrupts the work. But if a good fitting yoke makes the work easier. It makes each step the ox takes more productive. 
the effort necessary to do the task is lessened, Christ offers us his yoke, this symbol that Christ is with us, that we do not do this on our own, that we are not on our own, we are not alone, we are not isolated. Christ is with us. And we are called to learn from Christ, to do what Christ does, to be what Christ is, to draw from Christ's example of what it is to be human and to be Christ-like for the world. Christ, who is the Word made flesh. Christ, who is here and there and everywhere, like we talked with the kids at VBS last week. Christ, who is beyond our understanding and yet who knows us, who is intimately connected to us. There is nowhere we go that Christ is not. And yet Christ offers us the yoke, doesn't command it, says take it. Learn from me. Journey with me. As I've been traveling this last month, I've had the opportunity to walk a number of labyrinths. This single path to a center, a physical centering of yourself. In some ways, I think my enjoyment of labyrinths is because I am so bad at silent, quiet stillness of prayer. I gotta move and do something and God provides a way for me to center myself in prayer that does not require stillness and silence, but encourages active participation in the journey. And so I've walked the labyrinth here in Pretty Prairie. We went to New Mexico, Robin and I did, and I was able to revisit a place called Ghost Ranch. It's a Presbyterian summer camp. It's something like 27,000 acres, it's huge. If you're a Georgia O'Keeffe fan, part of the property is where her house was and where she did a number of her paintings. And it's really fascinating. We didn't do this on this trip, but on a prior trip, I've taken a horseback ride where they take you on a Georgia O'Keeffe tour and you'll go out and you're on horseback and you're riding through this beautiful country and you're looking at the mesas and they'll hold up one of her paintings and then they'll lower it and there's the dead tree in the painting and it hasn't changed a bit in 80 years. Or there's the cactus or there's the mountain in the background. At one place on the site they have this labyrinth. It's actually quite similar to the one I built here in Fort Scott. It's at the foot of what they call Kitchen Mesa. And it's truly beautiful. I've walked it in sun and rain. Just a place of peace. You can hear a creek in the background. It's what I think of when I think of a labyrinth. It's isolated, it's quiet. You're by yourself. And yet you're not. God's creation is all around you. I also got to walk this labyrinth again. And if I had to be nailed down to one, this is probably my favorite labyrinth I've ever walked. In part, because I really did not think I'd enjoy it. In fact, the first time I encountered it, I almost didn't walk it at all. It's in downtown Santa Fe, and a group of us from seminary were there, and one of my friends was into labyrinths like I am now, and I'd kind of dabbled, and he looked it up and we went, and it's in the courtyard of St. Francis Cathedral, downtown Santa Fe. There are buses and taxis right behind where Robin took this photo, people on bikes. It's also in a beautiful sculpture garden that the cathedral has, right next to a city park that also has a number of interesting things for pedestrians to walk up and look at the history and sculpture, and it's just a beautiful place. But people who don't know what the labyrinth is are, not surprisingly, oblivious to it. It's just a stone pattern. And so as you're walking the labyrinth, they walk across it to go see that piece of art or this flower or whatever. And I'm like, they're in my way. They're disrupting me. I just, no, it's noisy. It's... And then I walked it. And while I was walking it, I realized that's the journey. You're never actually on your own. You're never quite on the same page with everybody else. What they're doing is also valid, even though it's not what you're doing. 
And the task is not to get frustrated with one another because we're in each other's way. It's to appreciate the journey each of us are on. Because I too would like to look at that sculpture and see that flower and thank you for pointing out the beauty around me. And let me tell you about this labyrinth, what these funny looking stones are. Do we devour one another? Do we argue and consume and destroy? Or do we share and invite and appreciate? I walked this labyrinth that first time and my friend was in the middle of some really deep discernment. And the shadow of the cathedral was moving across. And just as Rob got to the middle, he knelt down and he put his hands on the center piece, which in this case is a Jerusalem style cross, and the light of the sun moved across and I snapped a photo that has become an incredibly important touchstone in his journey. So every time I get to Santa Fe, I take a photo again and we touch base. I've got another friend who's a Lutheran priest who went to seminary with a bunch of Methodists, it's kind of a strange story, but he's really into St. Francis, St. Francis Cathedral. When we were there, there was a beautiful sculpture of St. Francis in the background. Now they, in 2012, they switched it to St. Caterina, the first Native American saint. And they moved the St. Francis sculpture back into the sculpture garden. But I always go and find it and send the picture to my friend. It's a beautiful sculpture. It has sayings from St. Francis written all over it. But it was displaced that we might honor other stories, stories that had been overlooked or even obscured. So they moved the patron saint of the place back to the side that they might lift up a story that is difficult, a reminder of how we can go astray when we're too full of our own answers, when we're too sure of our own path that we denigrate others instead of learning from one another, instead of being focused on bearing good fruit, instead of sharing a yoke that fits well, that we might cooperate. It's a place full of lessons. And then I got to take Robin to another of my favorite places in the world. It's Puget Mesa, the ancestral homeland of the Santa Clara people. When I was first there in 2008, they had just won control of the site back from the state government. It had been a quasi-national park, it had been a state park, different colonial interests had controlled it for years. But this is where the Santa Clara Pueblo story begins, at least in this era. Their creation story involves climbing a ladder up from a prior world and finding themselves in this one, on this land, this place that is there, surrounded by the four mountains or the four mountain ranges. I'd never understood a sense of place. We in Western culture, we might know where home is, but we don't have a sense of place like a lot of indigenous cultures do. We move around. We seek to control our journey. Sometimes we yield that control. We become itinerant pastors. We go where the bishop goes, but still we move around. We don't have that sense of place. And yet in 2008, when I first was privileged to walk and climb this mesa and look out on the four mountain ranges that you can see from the top, I suddenly understood this is not my place, this is not my story. I'm not appropriating theirs, but I'm appreciating that they shared it with me. Since 2008, and they've regained control, they've now opened it basically as a tourist site. You can just book a tour anytime. And so Rob and I took advantage of that, and for the third time in my life, I got to climb Puget Mesa and stand and look at the peaks and hear the stories of the people told by the people themselves. They don't know for sure why they left this place. Around the year 1600, almost all of the Pueblo people abandoned the cliff sides and moved down by the streams. They built a different style of house, similar but different. You may be familiar with Teos Pueblo, the 
four-story and five-story adobe apartment complexes. But they changed their way of life radically. Archaeologists and the people themselves suppose it might have had to do with drought or famine, but something changed. Their society was transformed and not from the outside, although that would come soon enough. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more next week, but one of the very fascinating things about the Pueblo, there are 17 surviving Pueblo tribes. They are the only indigenous people in the world that have not been forced off their land. Because when the Spaniards arrived in this part of the world, they decided there was no, nothing worthwhile on the Pueblo's ancestral lands. There wasn't gold. They decided it was worthless, and they gave them a Spanish deed to the land. So when the French and the, Euro and the English showed up, they had Western legal documents. And perhaps miraculously, we honored them, in part because we didn't think there was anything worthwhile on the land. But they've not been moved. They've certainly been impacted, but they've not been moved. And they opened this place to visitors to tell their story, to talk about the complex relationship the Pueblos have with their native faith. They call it Kiva religion and the Santa Clara people and Roman Catholicism that was imposed on them but also adopted by them, and perhaps surprisingly, a deep United Methodist presence that was shared, sometimes imposed, sometimes invited, a deep story of cooperation and contention, and a people that are in my experience, filled with peace, love and joy, hope, self-control, confidence, generosity. I experienced the fruit of the Spirit in my interactions with the Santa Clara. I am renewed and I am equipped. Which brings me to a reading from Galatians. I chose to read that paraphrase. Eugene Peterson's paraphrase is actually much longer than Paul's, but I think it lifts up some meaning in ways that we might not hear it when we just read our translation of Paul's original Greek. Now, Paul's letter to the Galatians is at times a quite angry one. He has had his experience on the road to Damascus, his life has been transformed, he's gone around teaching and preaching, he's founded churches, and many places it's going quite well, but the Galatians are an argumentative bunch. And they keep moving away from the path that Paul thinks they should be on, and he writes quite harshly. At one point, just before this reading, he says he wishes his opponents would castrate themselves. This is not civil language, and yet you can see Paul reeling himself back in. And he does so in a lesson on the meaning of freedom, human freedom in Christ. This last week we celebrated Independence Day, a commemoration of the Declaration of Independence, of our separation from the crown of England, 13 colonies with very different ways of life, very different religious values, finding ways to cooperate together for their mutual freedom. We're still engaged in that experiment. Sometimes we think freedom means nobody can tell me what to do at all. I can do whatever I want. But sometimes we think freedom means nobody else is allowed to do anything I don't like. And we seek to use laws to control other people rather than to limit ourselves. We do this with faith too. Where is the boundary of freedom? How do we coexist with different ideas and different practices? How do we control that which we find offensive? 
without being controlling or limiting others' freedom? How do we live in society in connection that some of us would want to deny? And so I turn to Galatians thinking about what it means to be free, to be in Christian relationship, to be human. And I appreciate Eugene Peterson's work because he is one who has wrestled deeply with these topics. And I don't think he always gets it right, but every now and then he has a turn of phrase that opens the scriptures to me. That allows me to go deeper into the writing of Paul or Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John, or the other authors of the New and Old Testament. And it's not just the contemporary language, it's a seeking of meaning. I think we can go overboard with this. It's not about rewriting the Bible to say what we want it to say, but wrestling with what it does say. It's like a translation, in that we're wrestling. In a translation, you're seeking to say the word in another language. But if you get too strict about that, sometimes you come up with phrases that don't mean anything. The clearest example is when you try to translate idioms. You know, in English we'd say, knock your socks off, but that's not literally what we mean. So if you translate too literally, you come up with a phrase that might mean the right thing, but it doesn't convey the meaning. So there are other translators that seek to convey meaning rather than word-for-word -word translation. But now you're making interpretive decisions. And very often there's not just a word in that language that exactly catches all the nuance of the word in this language, which is why translation is never quite finished. My favorite example of that is actually not even from one language to another, but if you read John Wesley's writing in the original, in his handwriting, he talks over and over and over about how God prevents grace. Does that strike you as right? In John Wesley's time, the word prevent means comes before. But now we use the word prevent to mean stop, to cause not to happen. So we had to make up a word about a hundred years ago. Now in Wesley writings, you'll see prevenient, which means comes before. It's from the same Latin root, but the word that Wesley used changed its meaning. That's happened from the mid-1700s to the mid-2000s. Imagine the subtlety of Hebrew or Greek over thousands of years. This is where we get into trouble trying to translate and be certain about what was meant, especially when we're grasping at ideas that are beyond our human understanding. And so it's useful to read different translations, different paraphrases, to wrestle with meaning Galatians says it's absolutely clear that God has called us to freedom, to live a free life, but not as an excuse to do whatever we want, because ultimately that destroys us and others. Rather, we are to use our freedom, our liberation from sin and brokenness, to live in cooperation, to live in love. We are to live freely, animated and motivated by God's Spirit. I love that turn of phrase. We are moving in the Spirit. In Christ we live and move and have our being. We cannot escape that even though God gives us the freedom to say no. Ultimately we are bound together. We are created, not creator. We live and move in the Spirit. We have our being we recognize God's spirit moving in others even beyond our limitations and our boundaries and our definitions and our vocabulary. If we're looking for it, we encounter the movement of God. But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives. We've been talking about spiritual gifts, about gifts of community, about living as the body of Christ. Much the same way that fruit appears in the orchard. 
Did you hear the fruit of the Spirit in this reading? I've shared with you memorizing the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But they're just words unless we unpack them unless we live them out. And so Peterson doesn't use a list of words. He paraphrases, he describes, he expands upon. If we live God's way, we experience fruit, things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity, love, joy, peace. We develop a willingness to stick with things, patience, a sense of compassion, in the heart, generosity, a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people, faithfulness. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, excuse me, faithfulness, not needing to force our way in life, gentleness, and able to marshal and direct our energies wisely self-control, the fruit of the Spirit. And there is in that passage a wonderful example of why strict translation isn't good enough, why we also need to paraphrase and tell stories about the text. Because the most common translation of that list, where I say generosity, in most Bibles you'll find goodness. They both capture something essential about Paul's Greek word, but they're both incomplete. Because when you talk about generosity, usually we're thinking in terms of giving away our stuff or our resources to others. When we talk about goodness, we're usually thinking in terms of being good, following the rules, doing what we're supposed to. And yet neither of them quite captures the sense of the Greek a conviction that basic holiness permeates things and people. We are good as a fruit of the Spirit because we recognize the Creator in every one and everything we encounter. We are generous because we recognize in every one and everything we encounter our connectedness, our giftedness, our existence that we live and move and have our being in Christ, we are moved to generosity not to demonstrate our goodness, but as a natural fruit of being rooted in Christ, of bearing fruit, of being connected, of all of these metaphors, what it is to live in community. The word itself doesn't convey the fullness of meaning. We are invited to recognize a God who can do abundantly far more than we ask or imagine, who invites us to share the yoke, to learn from him, to be guided by him, to recognize that we are not on our own when we seek to do these things. Peterson, in translating Matthew 11, I use this in my first Lent here, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. That's how he translates, that's how he paraphrases, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. The unforced rhythms of grace, when we are in the spirit, when we're doing what Christ calls us to do, even difficult things become pretty easy. I was reminded of that just this morning. I've been scrambling a little bit. I didn't actually print the bulletin until 8.40 or so. I started it right before I went down to, for the biscuit breakfast. And I printed our bulletins, and they were on the printer, and then I printed a couple more, and I did the liturgist stuff, and I grabbed the liturgist stuff and the last few bulletins I printed, but I'd left the big pile of bulletins sitting on the desk, completely out of mind. Charlene noticed them, grabbed them, distributed them around the church, then let me know that had been handled. Matthew set up the sound system and the, the video this morning just helping out. We had people making the biscuits and the breakfast. We had someone scheduled to sing this week and they've had a bit of a family emergency and so Pat called Deanne. Of course Deanne will help out. In community, 
working together, each of us doing small things that makes worship together possible. We keep that same spirit. We move out in the community, each of us doing our small part. We can't do everything, but we can do something and do it very well. And together, especially if we pay attention to others' gifts and others' contributions, together we become the beloved community. We become the people that God is calling us to be. John Wesley talked about this yoke image often. And in a sermon entitled, On Love, he defined love and Christian community as to desire and pursue their happiness as sincerely and steadily as our own. We love ourselves and we love our neighbors. And if we truly love our neighbors, we don't settle for less for them. We step away from the competition. We recognize that we're on different paths. We appreciate the art or the flowers they're going to see. We share about the labyrinth and the centering that we're doing. We take turns. We share resources. We appreciate one another. And when we're on truly different paths, we wish each other well, rather than biting and devouring and competing since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads or sentiment in our hearts, but work out its implication in every detail of our lives. That means we will not compare ourselves with each other as if one of us were better and another were worse. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives. Each of us is an original. We are all exactly the same as everybody else, unique, and unrepeatable. And when we work together, we bear good fruit. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand and join in our hymn of response, How Firm a Foundation is number 529 in the United Methodist Hymnal.
may be seated. There are a number of announcements on the back. Uh, we've been asked for prayers for uh, Ryan uh, Mc McNichol, that's Gene Tucker's brother. And uh, on Monday the 17th, there's an opportunity. Uh, one of the blessings that Linda has been to us this summer, is she's been doing some grief counseling with people and uh, we had on the calendar a uh, grief workshop that she was going to lead and as she's been talking with several members of the congregation a recurring theme has come up about you know not wanting a singles group not looking for relationship but wanting something you know people to do things with coffee or a movie or games and so that uh, grief workshop on the 17th is going to also focus on how we might renew some senses of community. Uh, there have been groups here before uh, that scheduled outings for retired folks, kind of building on the Shepherd Center idea, doing something smaller and less programmatic, but more spur of the moment. And so Linda is helping us explore that. And so if that is something you're interested in, we particularly invite you to bring your ideas on Monday the 17th at 10 a.m. And we're going to look at how the church might help create those kinds of opportunities for folks who are looking for a little bit of connection both inside and beyond our congregation. Uh, I do want to highlight uh, the, the formal Shepherd Center that's coming up on August 4th. Uh, we'll have more details about that soon and the uh, concert Friday July 28th. Uh, we'll have a concert here at the sanctuary with uh, Faith's Journey, a trio out of Branson. Um, and I also want to, again, appreciate uh, all the folks that have been helping out with feeding families, uh, both inside and beyond this congregation. And um, Bonnie, I believe, has some eggs that Becky has brought. Uh, if you're one of the cake makers, uh, Becky is providing some eggs for us to help offset the cost of baking the cakes. And so uh, see Bonnie for some details on that. And uh, with that, let us continue in prayer. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for all of the different ways that you have gifted us, for the ways people step up to meet needs, to help one another, to share light on each other's paths. We ask that you would continue to bless us as a congregation, to deepen our relationship, to know and grow and serve and share, and to exemplify you in all that we do. We pray these things in the power of your Holy Spirit, in the name of our brother, Jesus the Christ, as we continue in prayer with the words that Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in Before we do the offertory, there were a couple more messages in the basket that I forgot to go down and get earlier. Uh, Deanne asked for prayers for uh, PW, for uh, med and treatments, and uh, we are celebrating the birth of Everly Rose Majors, uh, born on the 20th, 7 pounds, 9 ounces, parents are Gavin and Kylie Majors, sister is Berkeley, grandparents are Travis and Jessica Majors, and great-grandparents are Carol and Bruce Majors, so we celebrate Evelie's birth and uh, pray for PW and all those who are awaiting treatment and diagnosis. With that, I invite the ushers to come forward and collect this day's part of our tithes and offerings.
please join me in the prayer of dedication. O oh Lord, giver of life and source of freedom, I know that all I have received is from your hand. You are generous and kind. You faithfully give us what we need to live with enough to share. You call us to be stewards of your abundance, the caretakers of all you have entrusted to us. You have created us for community and connection. We are grateful and hope that we never take your blessings for granted. Help us to always use your gifts wisely and teach us to share them generously. May your purpose be fulfilled through these gifts and offerings. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Our closing hymn is Blessed Assurance, number 369 in the United Methodist Hymnal. Go in peace, sharing God's grace and mercy here, there, and everywhere as we exemplify the risen Christ individually and together. Amen. Amen.